Hello. Um, hi. Ooh, oh, that, that's loud. That's good. Um, I apologise for having a half a voice today. I feel like I sound a bit like a goose. Um, I'm not normally like this. Uh, I've got some sort of some sort some sort of lurgy. So uh, I hope you can I hope you can hear me all right. Um, does anyone know what this animal is? It's a it's a it's a siphonophore. Um, it, it looks a bit like a jellyfish. It's um, it's a colonial organism that, that's actually thousands or possibly even millions of, of individual organisms that all kind of have different functions but act as one big organism. Anyway, that's kind of a I, I, I kind of feel that's quite a good metaphor for what I'm going to talk about today, which is about um, designing for connected products, uh, specifically system UX for connected products. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a product UX strategy consultant. Uh, I'm independent. Um, I'm from a software UX background for longer than I kind of care to admit, uh, but for about the last uh, seven and a half years I've been specialising in what you might want to call Internet of Things or connected products um, or sometimes called hardware enabled services. Um, and I've worked on all kinds of things from health and well-being devices through to uh, connected industrial power tools. Um, but I have particularly spent quite a lot of time working in connected home and energy management. Um, some of my friends, I think I might have got some feedback here from one of these, these, these mics possibly. Um, some of my friends call me thermostat woman. Um, I've worked a lot on, on very on kind of mundane things. I'm not one of those people who's going to come and go, IoT is the future, and it's like, we will all have jackets that will allow us to, that will tell us which way to go while we're riding a bike. Um, I'm, I'm not here to tell you what the future is. I'm here to talk about mundane things that people are, are starting to use right now um, and how we can make them more valuable um, and, more, and more usable. Um, I, I'm the lead author of, of this book here. Um, I've actually got three of them to, to give away today. So um, if you think you might be interested, um, open up Twitter because I'm going to do a Twitter-based competition um, at the end of the talk. So you've been warned. Okay. Um, now, when people talk about IoT, uh, connected products, whatever, we'll call it IoT for short, um, you, you very often get these kind of images in the press, uh, which is some sort of shiny place, very often a kitchen, there's a connected fridge in the middle of it, you know, and some, I think we're starting to get past those references to reordering the milk. Um, but the point is it's all very shiny and everything is magically coordinating and anticipating your needs. Um, and, you know, well, that's all very, that's all very nice, but um, that's actually not really where we're at with this stuff right now. I am an enthusiast, uh, but I am also a realist, um, as, are, as are many of the people I know who work on the technology side in, in this field. And the reality is often that when we put connectivity and sensing into things, uh, we don't just allow them to do new things for us, create new possibilities. We also often create new ways that things can fail. Um, anyone hear about the pet net outage last year? This is a so, so this is a connected uh, connected pet feeder. If you're going to be out and about, uh, you put food in this thing, um, and you set up some rules, um, and it will dispense food so that your pets get fed. Last year, an AWS outage affected pet nets uh, affected pet net servers. Um, so basically, um, basically for, for a period of probably I don't remember how long it was. It was it wasn't it wasn't that long, um, but it was it was long enough that it mattered. Uh, pet net feeders were not working because the rules that govern when the when the food is released run in the cloud. And they were running in AWS, and AWS had some problems. Therefore, people's pets didn't get fed. So that's a new kind of a new kind of problem that's been introduced to to, to pet feeders. The other thing that often happens is, is this kind of, you know, things don't perhaps work quite as smoothly as you might expect them to. They feel a little bit, they can feel a little bit shonky. Um, this is a, a quote from a, a real review of the Wink Home Automation Hub, which was largely very enthusiastic and this, uh, somebody was being very excited about it. Um, and they said, it's a bit glitchy, but it's okay, you just have to be in the room at the same time. By which they meant that sometimes the app would tell you that the lights were, were off when actually they were on, and sometimes it would tell you that they were on when they were off. Um, and, uh, and, you know, this is like, you know, if you, if you want to make a really unreliable light switch, there are, there are better ways to do it than, than invoking the internet, you know. It's like, it's okay, you'll be in the room at the same time. Well, it's like, well, why does this thing go over the internet then? Um, sadly, this is often the, the, the state of things. They technically work, but they don't quite offer us the experience we, we expect. Um, now, when we think of designing for connected products, people often talk of sort of one of two or three things. Um, they might be talking about designing the hardware. You can count the thermostats in this presentation if you like. Uh, this one is by Philippe Stark for NetAtmo. 
Um, it, it sort of looks nice, but I'm not sure how usable it is. Um, so there's industrial design. There are the things themselves. Then there are designing interfaces for the things, so interfaces for embedded devices, and that might be buttons and screens. It might also be voice. It might be, it might be other things as well. Um, or it might be, we might talk about designing web and mobile apps to control or display data from devices. And that very often, um, when people, people come to approach me, uh, you know, they, they're sort of thinking in terms of, well, we're designing the thing, and then we, and then we, and then we stick an app on it. And I'm here today to talk about why that kind of thinking does basically doesn't work very well. Um, because if you go about designing the parts separately, you may very well do a good job of those things individually, but you may not end up with a great overall experience because users experience the whole thing um, as one system. So designers need to think about designing for coherent UX for that whole system. Uh, now, this is a, a, a complicated diagram, which I, I will try not to, to spend too long on. Um, this is my way of thinking about the different layers of... It's my own stack, if you like. Tim had a stack, I have a stack. Um, this is about uh, my way of thinking about the, the sort of different layers of <coughs> that can affect user experience of, of, of an IoT system. So at the top, you've got the, the kind of very visible things, so kind of interfaces, visual, you know, whether they're visual, whether they're, whether, they're, whether they're other types of interfaces, interaction design, and the industrial design are the things themselves. Those are the things that users see and they can touch. Underneath that, you've got some other factors that come into play when you're dealing with different types of interface or different types of device at the same time. Um, so one of those is, is interusability. This is about the kinds of issues that creep in when you're, when you're interacting with multiple things at the same time. Conceptual models, how users understand the system to work. And then you've got some broader kind of more strategic, uh, strategic and technical issues. So services, so it might not just be about digital interactions. You might have to offer uh, customers things like installation, things like support. You've got to offer those things over time. So you've got to think about that, uh, about that kind of experience. Um, productization, a lot of products, particularly in consumer IoT, uh, maybe aren't very sure who their audience is, or they're maybe over-enthusiastic about what mass market actually wants as opposed to early adopters. Um, so make, figuring out who it's for and making sure it's actually got a solid value proposition that they can get behind and, and believe in and understand even um, is really important. And then underpinning everything um, is technology, so platform design. It might be things like, have you got the right APIs to build the system you want? It might be things like figuring out how things connect and whether they can coordinate in the ways you want them to. Those are all complicated things and questions for, for uh, uh, way beyond the scope of the time I've got today. Um, so today I'm going to focus on a couple of things in this, in this interusability layer, because I think this is where there are some really practical implications for people from software backgrounds who are, start, who are coming to work on systems that are enabled by, by hardware. Um, and I've picked on two of the key concerns from interusability. First one being composition, so figuring out how to distribute functionality around that system um, and continuity, so thinking about networked interactions. So composition is all about figuring out which bit does what, as far as the user is concerned, and also to some extent under the hood, and how users should understand that. Um, more thermostats. Is that three so far, I think? Um, they're just a good example because they have screens, and most of us can relate to them. Um, and they have some interactions on them, and there are lots of them, so they're easy to compare. The point of these two, uh, you might be, some of you may well have some, may well have one or other of these in your homes. Uh, the one on the left is the, is the Tado. Now, the Tado is more or less a white plastic box with most of the interactions offloaded onto a phone app. Um, and that's a nice decision in some ways because it means that you can you keep the, the bill of materials down for, for building the device. Um, putting your interactions on a phone app means that if you want to change the functionality that that box offers over time, you can introduce new features, you can move the UI around. Uh, you know, you've, got, you, you've saved yourself some money on the hardware and you've also given yourself the flexibility to, to upgrade it. The downside is that if someone doesn't have access to that mobile app, maybe they're in a home where they just aren't set up, uh, maybe they can't find their phone, maybe their phone's broken, you've got very limited control of the device. So you're actually worse off then than you would have been with, with a conventional stat. On the right, we have the British Gas Hive. Uh, I probably maybe some of you may have one of those. Um, and in common with a lot of other thermostat, um, thermostat companies, what British Gas have done is mirror basically all the interactions between 
Um, you could do virtually everything you would need to do, at least in relation to the thermostat, on the hardware as well as in the app. And that sort of means that the hardware is a bit more expensive to produce, gives you potentially a nicer experience or, or more float, or, you know, or at least you don't have to have your phone to be able to use it. But it also means that as they start rolling out other devices over time, uh, or they want to update things, you're, you're kind of stuck with this, this device that's got um, a certain number of buttons and a dial. Um, so if you want to roll out some new features, you might, just, you might have to consider not putting those on the hardware itself, just putting them in the app. So yeah, there's, there's not so much flexibility um, for the future. And there's no, not necessarily one right or wrong way to approach a particular device. Particularly, it massively depends on, on context. But it's interesting to see how some of the different approaches that, that companies take to, to doing this uh, can, be, can be very similar even across different product types. So that pattern of lots of interact, most of the interactions on the hardware or most of the interactions mirrored on the device um, is a very common one you see in product categories. Here we've got uh, two products from very, very different categories that have basically done the same thing. Uh, the one on the left uh, is a GoPro. I'm sure some of you will, will recognize that. Um, the GoPro has um, a few key tasks on the device, so you're pressing buttons on your head, so you can't do anything too complicated, but you can start and stop recording uh, with more complicated interactions on the smartphone app. The one on the right um, is, the, is the Willow Connected Breast Pump. Now, you might not think of a breast pump as being something that, that needs connectivity. Um, the reason it has it is because this is something that, uh, for those of you who have had kids or know people who've had kids, um, normally breast pumps are a thing that you have to sort of sit down and be milked like a cow and you can't do anything else while you're using it. This one is designed to just sort of fit under your clothes so you can get on with doing what and be discreet, so you can get on with doing whatever else you wanted to be doing. As a result, you can't do anything complicated with the controls on the device itself because it's underneath your clothes. Um, so you, you use, there's a, there's a smartphone app that allows you to, allows you to control it, which is kind of a, I think it's a pretty neat thing. Um, another option is to offload um, certain functionality into the app that's maybe not available on the device itself. Uh, Nintendo did an interesting thing with the, the new Switch console uh, where the parental controls are in a separate app. So if you want to give your child 20 minutes more before dinner and then you want to force them to stop, you don't have to elbow them out of the way and go digging around in the settings menu and program that anymore. You can just do that from your phone. So, so there's, there are different, there's a, a, a bunch of different models that work in different circumstances. Um, the other thing you need to think about is, and, and, and it's a thing that users sort of need to begin to understand now, which is a bit of a, which is in a, in a way that perhaps they don't need to think about web technology, um, is how devices actually connect. Because products that appear to do the same thing and appear to deliver the same benefit can actually work in quite different ways. And that can have, can have implications of which one might be better or worse for their, for their needs. Um, so Philips Hue, like these are two connected light bulbs. Uh, Philips Hue bulbs uh, work over a uh, low power, local frequency, uh, local radio um, frequency thing called uh, protocol called Zigbee. Uh, so they connect to uh, a bridge in the home, which then connects out to the internet. Uh, Lifex bulbs have Wi-Fi uh, and and basically connect directly to the internet through your through your router. So if you have um, if you set up some rules to turn the lights on at certain times at certain times of day uh, on the Hue, uh, those rules run. Uh, are, are in the cloud, but they're also locally on, held locally on the bridge. Uh, with the LIFX, they're entirely controlled by the cloud. And that matters. This is a question of, of understanding which code runs where. And that's not the kind of thing we normally ask users to, to have to think about. And I'd prefer it if we didn't really have to ask them to, to, to think about that in the context of connected products either. But it matters, because what it always happens is that if there is different parts of the system will occasionally lose connectivity, things will stop working, you're dealing with distributed systems of lots of different parts, and occasionally one bit won't be able to talk to the other bit, and so things will go wrong. They might not go badly wrong, hopefully, if you've architected it well enough, um, but they might go a bit wrong. Um, and so the implications can be very different depending on the different decisions that have been made. So if your rules, your lighting rules are running in the cloud and your internet connection goes down at 8 o'clock when they're due to come on, your lights are not going to come on. If your rules are held locally as well, um, then um, you know, the internet connection goes down, your lights will still come on. 
So as a user, you're there going, well, I don't, you know, I thought, but I, I don't know, I can't, uh, did, my, what, did the lights, I don't know, did the lights come on? Why didn't the lights come on at home earlier? I thought they were going to. Um, you know, and it, it can be down to stuff like this. So we're actually asking users to, to begin to get their heads around system models in a way that perhaps we, we, we don't really with, 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 uh, with other conventional software, internet technology. Second thing I want to talk about was um, the idea of continuity. And this is thinking about interactions that span more than one device. Um, this is about thinking not just about devices and UIs in isolation. It's about thinking about the spaces in between, what happens when things go across a network and how that's experienced. Now, one of the words that um, I'm hearing it less and less, which is good, but a word that often gets bandied around in the context of, of sort of cross-device interactions is, oh, it will be seamless. Um, and and I, I hate that because it isn't, basically. Um, if you, you've ever had to learn anything about networks, you'll know that they, they're not seamless. Things do go wrong. There are glitches. You know, they're not always, nothing is 100% reliable. Um, and what it, what it usually, continuity usually means instead, is that you have to think about handling delays and sporadic connectivity much more gracefully. So Andy's talk about time earlier was, uh, was, was quite relevant on this. Now, hopefully, sorry, I might be a bit loud. This is um, a video. Right, so now we're on the Wi Fi. Open up the app. Of me using some. Here we go, here. turn the light on. <coughs> That's over local. This all worked beautifully. That was quick. Turn it off. That was quick. Yeah. Right. So let's disconnect from the Wi Fi. Go and again. So we're on 4G. So this is this is now going to go over the internet. By the internet. Mm -hmm. So much slower. Not much at all. Come on. Here we go. Okay. So oh, it's so much slower, isn't it? So it's not terribly, terribly slow, but hopefully you saw that there's a difference between those two things. One of those is over a local internet connection, and it was pretty much immediate. The other one was being forced to go over the internet, probably via some data center in North Carolina or you know, somewhere in the Pacific, who knows. Um, and it was, it was kind of quick, but it, it didn't work the first time, which you may have spotted. Um, but it was, it's, not, it's not desperately slow, but it's a little bit slow. And sometimes those kind of interactions can be, can, be a lot, can be a lot slower than that. The internet is designed to, largely, most of it is designed to get things around reliably rather than for them to be, for them to be immediate. And so you get these little, little pauses in interactions which can be, um, you know, we, we kind of accept as being normal perhaps in, in software interactions, but we have millions of years of learning of the real world that when you interact with physical objects, they respond immediately. And so it can feel really weird and sometimes a little bit broken. Um, when, when things take time to respond. Um, and at worst, um, latency and delays in connecting can, can even basically undermine your value proposition. This is the, uh, this is the first generation of the Ring doorbell. Um, and this took 30 seconds to connect to the cloud service. So imagine that one of the key use cases of these things is couriers. Courier comes to your door. They've got other places to, to go. They're being paid by the job. Um, they ring the doorbell and nothing apparently happens for 30 seconds, they're gone. You know, this, this, is a, this is a product in that generation at least did not, did not really work for the, for the purpose of what it, for, which it, for which it was being designed. And the problem is that people just can't tell whether it's doing anything. They can't tell whether it's working. So in the absence of feedback, you know, within, within well-defined timeframes of um, usability, um, that something is happening, people just assume that stuff is broken. Um, this is an example to show you um, of, a, of a, a related but slightly different issue. This is my um, old uh, British Gas Hive at home. And what I'm going to do is change the temperature on the device. Sorry, another thermostat. Um, and uh, told you. And, uh, and uh, wait to see how long it takes for the smartphone app to respond and show the same number. So we're looking for these things to, to, to show the same number. My son getting bored. Mommy. 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 Silas, mummy's busy. Won't you sack? Daddy. 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 Da
Daddy's filming Nanny. Daddy. Daddy. Anyway, it, it, it goes on. It, go, it goes on. It goes on for a bit. The point is that you, you never see the, num the, the target temperature being the same on the thermostat as you, as, as, you, as you actually see it on the smartphone app. Now, I'm not quite sure why that happened that way around, but you said you, you, the, typically the problem is that you, you often get somebody interacting with the smartphone because it's just easier than using the device. Um, and, uh, and the device, because it runs on a battery, only checks into the network every 90 seconds or so to see if there are new instructions. So you can't force an instruction through to it to make, to make it change state. So if you're standing in front of it with an app, this is not just hive. This is I'm not I'm not you know not dissing British gas, um, but if you if you stand in if you stand in front of it, you you end up with two devices that are giving you different information about the status of the system, which also breaks some pretty fundamental usability principles. Um, so so this is a and this is a this is a very very common problem with lots and lots of connected devices. Many things run on batteries. Many and it's not always possible to to, to give them mains power, um, and because it takes such a huge amount of power to to maintain an open network connection. Most of them are asleep most of the time, at least in terms of connectivity. So the more often they connect, the faster the battery runs down. More data, more often, this kind of you know, seamless interactions requires a massive battery. And sometimes you can't use a massive battery, either for reasons of cost or for reasons of, for reasons of context. Um, cat trackers are a, are, a, are a case in point. There's a limit to the size of battery you can put on a cat and persuade it to wear. Um, but if your cat goes missing, obviously you want to keep receiving, you, you, you know, you want to be able to track it, you want to see where it is. So, and that's a product category that hasn't quite got that balance right yet. Big dogs, we're all right, but, but, but cats, um, it, the, the, there's nothing on the market that's, that's particularly you know, got the right balance yet, purely through battery technology. So the impact on UX of both of these things is, is quite interesting, and it bubbles all the way up to the UI layer. Um, and I like to think about a switch that's controlling a smart bulb or a smart plug attached to a lamp. When you press a switch, the state of the switch is doing two things. First of all, it's telling you, confirming to you that you've pressed the switch. And secondly, it's telling you that your action has been executed. So you might, you might think, well, I'll design a button that looks like a power switch and, you know, you tap it and, you know, and it changes state and that's like, yeah, you know, it, you, you're done. But because of those issues, we can't guarantee that the thing is actually going to change state at the same point as, as, uh, that you immediately after you press the button. So, you know, user can't tell. If you do this, user can't tell unless they're in the room with the thing, in which case why well, use the internet, whether that action has been executed or whether it's still in progress. So there's a couple of things you can do. And one option is you can basically just lie. You can pretend that the thing, that that action has been executed, and then if something goes wrong, you just kind of like shuffle along and go, um, sorry, actually, we didn't do that. Now, that's sort of what Philips do. You might have seen, seen this from the video. Except they don't apologize. They just go, the sliders just move back down. It's like, nah. Um, and that's a kind of not a very good execution of that, I don't think, because it makes them look a bit flaky. It makes it look like they just basically couldn't be asked. But sometimes that's not a bad thing to do. The second option is you can separate confirming you press the button from confirming your action was executed. Um, so you, you acknowledge, it's like, okay, you press the button, um, and then you confirm when it's done. Now, a kind of subtle execution of this, this is from the Wemo smart plug. Um, so the switch is off at the top. Um, when you press the button, you get this interstitial state uh, where the, you, you see pro some, something is happening. Um, and then when it gets confirmation back from the plug that it's changed state, it shows you that it's on. You can be very, very, very explicit about this if you need to be, which you might need to be in some circumstances. Um, this is a, the, the old version of the Lowe's Iris home automation system. It's a US system. Um, whenever you change anything in this version of Iris, uh, you get this little message which you maybe can't read on this screen, which says, sending changes, please don't exit. And you're like, well, I can't touch anything, it will break. Um, and then you get this message that says, yeah, it's all right, we've changed the settings. Um, and that's very, very literal. That's a very engineering solution to, to, to the problem. 
Um, the reason they did that was because they've got some kind of emergency cases on this, so um, panic buttons and, and things like that, where it's incredibly important that you don't give the impression that help is on its way or that the action has been carried out until you're absolutely certain that it has. So this was done with good intentions. Um, but it, it introduces the kind of perception that, you know, of, of the, there is a possibility of failure. You know, we, we, oh, let's see if we can do this. It might not work, um, which is actually what's going on. But maybe you don't want to remind people of that every time they're just trying to turn a light on or something. So the, so the right solution really very, very much, very much depends on, on, on context. That was all I have time for today. I hope that was a, a, um, a useful introduction. This is, um, this is a, another siphonophore. This is a cartoon siphonophore. Um, I like siphonophores. I tried to get one on the book, but it wasn't colourful enough. Um, so, um, if there's tons more in a the book, uh, there is. Uh, this is this runs to about 700 pages. So, if you're interested in one, but you're, uh, you know, bear, bear, do bear that in mind. It's makes a good weapon. Um, if you are interested in in winning one, um, first three people to tweet me with "I want a book," and please include the conference hashtag. Um, I will tweet you afterwards and let you know who wins. Thank you.